a member of the Board of Governors of the Middle East Institute and of Southwestern Medical Foundation. Uh, Mr. Jordan is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a past president of the Dallas Bar Association. Uh, Mr. Jordan is a frequent commentator with international media, including CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, Bloomberg, and the New York Times. His memoir, Desert Diplomat, Inside Saudi Arabia Following 9-11, was published by Potomac Books. Thank you again, and welcome, Mr. Jordan. Yeah, thank you very much. It's great to be with all of you today. Uh, I think probably some of you may know my wife, Kathy Donovan, who uh, heads the uh, real estate uh, business for uh, her company, Title Partners. Uh, and through Kathy, I met Hannah and have, uh, I'm sure met a number of others of you as well. Uh, I thought I would speak today a little bit about my experience as ambassador uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I arrived there a month after 9-11, so it was uh, a turbulent time. Uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in the, uh, the oil patch today, maybe of interest to you, and then finish up with some discussion about Dallas as an international city uh, through the lens of the Mayor's uh, International Advisory Council, of which I'm a member. So let me start out with uh, the ambassador part first. Uh, some of you may be wondering why a non-career guy like me, who was a lawyer most of his life, ended up being the ambassador to Saudi Arabia. And I wondered that myself when, when I was asked to do it. Uh, I had been uh, a lawyer for George W. Bush uh, when he was the uh, president of the Texas Rangers Baseball Club in the early 90s. Uh, we had a major uh, matter that I handled successfully with him. We stayed in touch, became friends. He uh, became governor. We stayed in touch. And then finally, he was uh, elected president, as you know, in 2000. Well, I called him on his cell phone to congratulate him, and I got his voicemail. So he then calls me back, and he gets my voicemail, and I still have a tape somewhere. And he said, hey, Bob, this is George, or I guess I should say President-elect Bush returning your call. And from that moment on, he was no longer George. He was Mr. President. And uh, we started talking about what I might do in his administration. Uh, he wanted me to serve if I was willing to do so. Uh, I wasn't really anxious to uh, go overseas, uh, but finally uh, the White House called and said the president would like me to be his ambassador to Saudi Arabia. This was probably in the spring of 2001, and it was about the worst idea I had ever heard of. Uh, I had the stereotypical view of Saudi Arabia a hot, desolate place, completely intolerant, no religious freedom, uh, no freedom for women. Uh, and uh, it was a, a very uh, difficult place to be, uh, lots of uh, uh, extremists running around. And so I took a while to think about it. Finally, I was sitting home one night and my son was home from college and he turns to me and he says, you know, dad, when your friend, the president of the United States asks you to serve your country, you really can't say no, can you? And I said, no, Peter, I've decided I am gonna take this job. And so I spent the summer of 2001 going to Washington uh, most of each week, uh, going to think tanks, learning what the job was. But you may still ask, well, why is it that they didn't assign a career foreign service officer uh, to be the ambassador? Well, in, in the United States, we have probably 150 to 180 uh, ambassadors at uh, embassies and missions. Of that, about a third are politically appointed or not career people. And in this case, uh, the Saudis uh, did not want a career foreign service officer. They would refuse to give credentials to anyone who was a career foreign service officer to be the ambassador. They wanted someone who was a friend of the president, who could get the White House on the phone, who could go over the heads of the bureaucracy, and who really, frankly, didn't have a career to protect. And so that was me. Uh, and uh, I was uh, honored that the president asked me to serve. Uh, I spent uh, most of the fall, uh, again, learning uh, more about the job. And finally, in August of 2001, I went down to Crawford to see President and Mrs. Bush. Uh, we had a really nice casual lunch. 
they're sitting around in uh, jeans and t-shirts. Uh, it was uh, extremely warm and, and friendly. But the president said, you know, uh, my dad, referring to his father, President Bush 41, my dad knows the Saudis better than anybody. Uh, he's actually with Prince Bandar, the Saudi ambassador right now uh, at their house in Kennebunkport, Maine. But he'll be back in Houston uh, on Monday. You need to go down and see him. So I drove down to Houston that Monday and went to see the president, H.W. Bush, and he could not have been nicer to me. Uh, he told me a lot about the Saudis, the royal family, uh, Prince Bandar, uh, who was the dean of the diplomatic corps at that point, having served about 22 years as the ambassador to Washington. Uh, and so I, I spent about an hour with him, got up to thank him as I was leaving, and then he, he stops and he says, Bob, come back, come back. And he pulls out a note card from his desk and starts writing a note. And he puts it in an envelope and gives it to me. And he says, here, give this to Bandar when you see him. Well, I went out to my car and he hadn't sealed the envelope. So I took that as permission uh, for me to look inside and see what was in it. So I opened up the note card and it said, dear Bandar, great being with you last week in Kennebunkport. Sorry the fish weren't biting. Please be nice to this guy or Barbara will get you. And so that was my introduction to the Saudis and to Prince Bandar. Uh, and when I showed it to him, uh, he gave a huge cackling laugh, uh, enjoying the sense of humor of President Bush. I have really not expected to end up in Saudi Arabia until maybe uh, January or February of, of 2002. Uh, they were planning for me to have language training uh, to spend some more time on consultation. But of course, on September 11, 2001, uh, the world changed and my life changed forever. Uh, and this was a, a massive shock. Uh, the White House uh, immediately uh, called for a confirmation hearing on my nomination in the Senate. I had my confirmation hearing in early October. But of course, the, in, in those days, the Democrats were controlling the Senate and the Foreign Relations Committee was chaired by none other than Joe Biden. And he had been holding out the president's nominations. But in this case, he said, if I agreed to go to my post immediately uh, without language training, without further consultations, then they would give me an expedited hearing. So I have the hearing, it went fine, but I'm sitting around waiting to see if the Senate was going to approve me or not. Finally, I'm in the, Was in the Watergate Hotel in Washington. And I'm watching TV about nine o'clock at night and scrolling across the screen, it says Robert Jordan confirmed as ambassador to Saudi Arabia. That was how I found out I'd been confirmed. Uh, my own government uh, didn't take the time to tell me. Uh, and so I had to say it on TV. But in about two days, I was sworn in by Colin Powell and on an airplane off to Saudi. Uh, when I arrived there, of course, my first question was, are the Saudis friend or foe? 15 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 had been Saudis. And clearly there was an atmosphere of extremism in the country. Uh, and I needed to know uh, who was behind it, whether the government was behind it, uh, and whether there were further threats out there. Uh, I, uh, I then called on the governor of Riyadh, Prince Salman. Uh, Prince Salman is now King Salman. He's now the king of the country. Uh, but at the time, he was the longest serving governor uh, in uh, Riyadh province. And I asked him, how could it be that 15 of these hijackers were Saudis? And he paused, he turned to me and he said, oh, no, Ambassador, none of these hijackers were Saudis. This was Israelis who did this. This was an Israeli plot to drive a wedge between America and Saudi Arabia. Well, I couldn't really believe what I was hearing. Uh, and so I went then next to uh, the Minister of Interior, Prince Nayef, and he gave me the same story. They had cooked up this story that it was a, an Israeli plot, uh, which of course made no sense at all. Finally, I met with the Saudi uh, Foreign Minister, Prince Saud. Now, Prince Saud was the son of the late King Faisal, uh, who was uh, one of the great kings of Saudi Arabia. Uh, Prince Saud had gone to Princeton. He spoke better English than I did, uh, and he got it. He understood that the Saudis had an extremism problem, that it had now come to a head, 
and that they needed our help uh, in order to uh, address it. So we spent the next several months trying to get a handle on what the level of threat was, the Al Qaeda presence in Saudi Arabia. But I had great difficulty getting Saudi cooperation. They would not share uh, the results of any interrogations with our CIA or FBI people. They wouldn't let our people sit in on the interrogations. Uh, they wouldn't tell them what was in the uh, pockets or the, the, uh, the cell phone or hard drives of their computers. And uh, so this was a very sluggish process that was not satisfactory to us. Um, we started making some progress, but it was still very slow. And so uh, I then learned that we actually had problems in our own government. Uh, our CIA our station chief had asked me to uh, check on some information that we had requested uh, several uh, months earlier. Uh, some names of uh, uh, witnesses that we needed to interrogate, and we hadn't received it. So I went into the Minister of Interior, Prince Nyeth, pounded to the table and said, we, can, we just can't wait any longer. We have to have this information. He looked at me and he said, well, Ambassador, uh, we gave that information to your FBI people two weeks ago. Why don't you go check with your own government? Uh, and so I then discovered that we had kind of a, a, uh, a rivalry going on between the FBI and the CIA, and they were simply not sharing information with each other. So a, a couple of weeks later, I went back to Washington and uh, met with Bob Mueller, who at the time was the head of the FBI, and told him the problem. Uh, to his credit, he addressed it and made sure that uh, they uh, instigated better cooperation uh, with the CIA. I also went out to Langley and visited with George Tenet, the head of the CIA, made the same request of him, and I think he and Mueller uh, ended up co collaborating much better uh, going on. Uh, but the Saudis continued to be in denial about the uh, terrorist threat at the time. Uh, there was a lot of money being funneled to Al Qaeda, uh, largely through Saudi charities. We never did uh, determine that senior government officials were actually behind the 9-11 attacks but certainly there was an atmosphere created by their uh, extreme uh, religious practices uh, that was conducive to uh, the kind of uh, terrorist activity that we saw. It really wasn't until uh, May of 2003 that we, we had a, a true breakthrough with the Saudis. And this was really a tragic night of May 12th when three housing compounds housing uh, many uh, Westerners and Americans uh, were attacked in suicide bombing attacks by Al-Qaeda. Uh, a number of Americans were killed, as were a number of Saudis. I had requested additional security for those housing compounds because of intelligence reports that suggested that uh, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda uh, were finally starting to consider attacks within Saudi Arabia. Uh, I uh, was furious, of course, when these attacks occurred in the middle of the night. I spent the night uh, gathering our uh, uh, emergency action team, sending officers to the hospitals, uh, making condolence calls to those who had lost, uh, lost loved ones. Uh, the next morning, I had a, a previous appointment with uh, Crown Prince Abdullah, who was running the kingdom. And I went in uh, with a pretty angry demeanor. He could tell that. And he turned to me and he said, Mr. Ambassador, I owe you an apology. You had requested additional security, uh, and I was the one who decided that you didn't need it. And I, I can assure you, though, uh, that from this day forward, we will uh, capture or kill those responsible for these attacks, and we will treat just as harshly anyone who has given them aid or comfort. Uh, my, uh, my book, Desert Diplomat, outlines a lot more of what I went through, and I don't want to uh, take your time with a number of, uh, of stories, uh, but there are a couple of stories that I think are important to me and you might find interesting. One of them has to do with uh, religious practices uh, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the only uh, organized religious meetings that were authorized, were, of course, were Muslim meetings. So Christian uh, religious services uh, in public were prohibited. They did say that it was possible to have private uh, Christian religious services. Uh, and so in the embassy, we would hold services on every Friday, which was the, the day of rest uh, there. 
and several hundred people would show up for several different services. Uh, we also had a small Jewish contingent who would uh, practice their uh, religion as well. But I got a call one day from someone who came uh, to, uh, asked to come to see me. Uh, there was a, a religious uh, individual named Michael Baba Yimba, who was Sudanese, but he was a devout Sudanese Christian. His parents, in fact, had been uh, strong Christian uh, evangelical uh, speakers in Sudan. They had both been murdered uh, for being Christians. And Michael was the director uh, of security of the Rosewood Hotel in Riyadh. And he had been arrested for holding a religious service in his home. Now, he probably had 20 or 30 people in his living room, but the religious police burst in and took him away. His wife uh, didn't know where he was for a couple of weeks. Uh, and he uh, uh, finally, she located him in a prison where he had been held uh, without charges. Uh, he was held for uh, a lengthy period of time. And then they approached me because they were told that he was going to be deported back to Sudan. Well, if he had been sent back to Sudan, that would have been a death sentence, particularly in light of the murders of his uh, two parents. And so they asked me to do what I could to see if he could uh, be sent somewhere else. I went back to see the Minister of Interior, Prince Nayef. I told him the story and I said that uh, I would like 30 days to find some place where he could be sent uh, in a place of safety uh, other than going back to Sudan. And the minister said, all right, ambassador, you have 30 days. So I set to work with the State Department and we actually found uh, an Episcopal seminary outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, that would take him as a graduate student in divinity. So he and his wife uh, thankfully were released. Uh, he was able to go uh, to Pittsburgh and uh, surprisingly, a few years later, I get a phone call and it's a very weak uh, connection, but it's Michael. And it turns out Michael now lives in the Dallas area and actually has a church here. And so we had a wonderfully warm reunion uh, a few years ago uh, and stayed in touch ever since then. He has spoken to my class at SMU about his imprisonment about human rights in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I think it is uh, one of the uh, real success stories we had uh, during my time uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. I, I'd like to tell you about another story. Uh, and this has to do with a presidential summit meeting uh, between Crown Prince Abdullah and President Bush that occurred uh, in uh, the spring of 2002 uh, in Crawford. Uh, Things had not been going well with the Saudis with regard to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and uh, Crown Prince Abdullah was really ready to terminate relations with the United States uh, over this issue. And so Pres Vice President Cheney came out to Saudi Arabia and invited the Crown Prince personally to come to Crawford. Well, after the vice president left, uh, the crown prince called me in and said, why am I being invited to Crawford? Why am I not being invited to the White House? And I said, <laughs> doing the best I could, I said, uh, well, uh, your royal highness, it's because this is the president's home. This is actually a higher level of invitation than merely going to the White House. He's invited you to his personal home uh, in Crawford. And only one other head of state has ever been invited uh, to that home. Well, this satisfied him for the moment, but his advisors were still telling him that he shouldn't come. Finally, he decided to come, but he brought with him uh, graphic videos of uh, the carnage that was uh, being suffered by the Palestinians, in his view, at the hands of the Israelis, uh, and he wanted President Bush to see this. So the meeting starts in Crawford, and I'm present for this meeting. Uh, but Colin Powell was there also with me, the Secretary of State. And he said to me before the meeting started, he said, you know, Bob, uh, we're on this bus. We had taken a bus from the airstrip uh, near Crawford uh, with the Saudis. And uh, we had had a fairly tense bus ride. And he said, I'm not going to go back with you on the bus with the Saudis when this meeting is over. 
because I'm going to stay to do a press conference with the president. And if this meeting breaks up badly, you're going to be on the bus with a bunch of really angry, angry Saudis. Well, the meeting started out very badly. And our State Department interpreter uh, turned to us at one point in the morning and said, uh, they're talking about walking out. Well, the president at this point says, let me do this. Let's take the Crown Prince for a ride around the ranch in my Ford F-250 pickup truck. So they jump in the pickup and I've taken this ride with the president. They ride around the ranch with the Secret Service chasing them and their SUVs behind him. And they're gone for about 45 minutes. And during this, this trip in the pickup, with the interpreter in the back, in the back seat, uh, Crown Prince Abdullah sees a wild turkey run across the road in front of the pickup. And he says, Mr. President, this is an omen. This means that our talks are going to go well and we're going to make progress. So, so they came back uh, basically uh, beaming, uh, holding hands arm in arm, and the rest of the meeting went surprisingly well. So then we have the bus ride back to the airstrip with the Saudis. And I'm riding with the Crown Prince, with Prince Sal, the foreign minister, and with Prince Bandar, uh, the, uh, the ambassador. And they are so giddy that things have gone well that Sal and Bandar start singing Broadway show tunes. So they're saying, my fair lady, why can't a woman be like a man? Or the rain in Spain falls mainly in the plain. And so here are these Western educated potentates, princes of the royal family, leaders of their country, so giddy that the, the meeting has gone well, uh, that they're singing Broadway show tunes. It's something that I don't think I will ever forget. Uh, so these are just a few of the, uh, the experiences that I had in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they, uh, I think, have taught me a number of lessons. Uh, first, uh, you, you need to be able to rely on uh, your staff uh, as ambassador. Uh, I had a wonderful staff. My deputy, Margaret Scobie, uh, later became ambassador to Syria and then later ambassador to Egypt and had a really distinguished State Department career. I had great intelligence officers. I had great uh, military uh, contacts. Uh, one of my military advisors was a one-star army general named Marty Dempsey. Uh, Marty later ended up uh, getting four stars and ultimately became the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, it was a remarkable experience for me and I got to meet a lot of uh, dedicated career people uh, who uh, truly were uh, heroes in my view. Uh, State Department people often, you know, are uh, ignored in uh, the role that we play internationally. But these career people don't have body armor. Uh, they go into dangerous locations to learn things about the host country. Uh, they are uh, in many ways not protected by the kind of bodyguards that I had uh, even uh, as ambassador. And so they, uh, we have lost a number of them in the line of duty over the years, uh, but I think our our uh, attention needs to go further uh, to what these career State Department people can do. They're not political. I never saw a hint of political orientation from any of them that I dealt with. Uh, and I was really honored to serve with them. Let me turn now to a little bit about the oil business. Um, Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, is the world's largest exporter uh, of oil. And uh, they have set the market uh, in many ways over the years. After 9-11, uh, after the, immediately after the attacks, uh, the Saudi oil minister, uh, Ali Naimi, uh, offered to ramp up Saudi production in case America and the world needed uh, a larger supply of oil than, uh, than we could uh, provide. Uh, this is a kind of swing capacity that we've counted on in, in emergencies from time to time. But uh, as you know, uh, demand has, has been falling uh, for oil uh, for a while now. And uh, the 
the uh, coronavirus uh, epidemic uh, has really caused a demand collapse. So the Saudis and the Russians just a, a few months ago uh, talked about uh, reducing production. They've had an agreement over time to curtail production so that the price remains stable. Well, the Russians no longer wanted to curtail production. Uh, and so uh, the Saudis said, well, all right, then we're going to flood the market with oil because we want to maintain uh, our market share. Uh, this led to a massive collapse in the price of oil uh, at just exactly the wrong time because demand was collapsing anyway as a consequence of uh, the coronavirus. The Saudis and Russians uh, finally uh, reached agreement to uh, slow down production a, a little bit. Uh, oil has now hovered around $40 a barrel for West Texas Intermediate. And this is leading to quite a number of bankruptcies uh, in the United States. One of the reasons that uh, we have had such a massive supply of oil on the market uh, is actually because of U.S. production. U.S. production is five or six million barrels a day higher now than it was about five years ago. And that production uh, really accounts for uh, most of the surplus. And so it's the American shale producers who are now uh, suffering the most as a consequence of this glut. Uh, we've seen uh, surveys that suggest that about 35% of American producers believe that they can't last more than about a year uh, with the current price structure. Uh, that also means 65% of them say they can last longer than that, but you're going to be seeing a number of bankruptcies. We've already seen some uh, very large uh, shale producers uh, declare bankruptcy. Uh, we'll probably see some of the majors acquiring some of their production. Uh, experts have said that uh, it's not going to really result in uh, a change in the availability of oil, it will simply amount in a change uh, of ownership uh, of those resources. And so we'll see some of these assets uh, shuffled around, I think, uh, for quite some time. Uh, it is a uh, particular challenge, I think, uh, to uh, those of us in Texas, uh, because there is so much production uh, based here and so much of the shale production particularly has come out of the Permian Basin uh, and uh, the middle of the Odessa area of the state. Uh, the Dallas Metroplex, I think, is better positioned to weather some of this storm than some other parts of the state uh, because of the uh, diversity uh, of the economy here. But we are uh, still, I think, likely to see very soft demand uh, for quite some time. Uh, and the prices uh, around $40 a barrel uh, aren't likely to be uh, sufficiently high for the shale producers who particularly took on uh, fairly expensive debt uh, during the heyday uh, of shale production. The low cost producers have some advantage. And if you look at uh, the cost structure for the Saudis, for example, uh, the Saudi cost of uh, what's called lifting the oil uh, ranges from a very few dollars up to eight or ten dollars, uh, depending on whether it's uh, onshore or offshore production. So they have probably the lowest cost of production in the world, uh, and they can withstand lower prices. Uh, the Russians also can withstand lower prices, partly because their budget is uh, calibrated to uh, to not depend on on high prices. The Saudis, on, their, on the other hand, even though they have a low cost of production, uh, have massive budgetary needs, uh, which uh, they have to satisfy. Uh, their budget really requires oil in the 80 to 90 dollar range in order to break even. What does that mean? Well, that means that they're going to be operating at a deficit. They've been running huge deficits over the last five or six years. Part of this is because of the war in Yemen. Uh, this is a war that uh, the Saudis launched against a uh, sort of a ragtag uh, rebel group called the Houthis in Yemen, uh, who were a minority community there, discriminated against by the Yemeni government and the majority in Yemen. 
uh, and they decided to launch uh, a rebellion in 2011. It was a fairly low level rebellion. And then finally, by 2013 or so, uh, they were starting to cause some real problems. The Saudis then being uh, on their border and fearing uh, incursions by Iran, who was advising the Houthis, decided to launch uh, a campaign uh, against the Houthis. Well, the campaign has not gone well. They are spending about $5 billion a month uh, on this war. They were joined in it for a while by the United Arab Emirates. Uh, ultimately, the UAE finally said they'd had enough and bailed out. And so now Yemen is essentially an ungoverned country. The Houthis have taken over the capital. Uh, they are receiving uh, rockets and uh, drones uh, from Iran or with Iranian technology. And we're, we've got basically a proxy war going on that appears to have no end in sight. At the same time, Yemen is now beset by the coronavirus, and they have virtually no health care infrastructure. It is the most impoverished uh, country in the Middle East, uh, and it's one that is really a, in serious danger, I think, of uh, uh, falling in just to complete uh, disaster uh, and disarray. By the way, uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis have also not been immune to the coronavirus. Uh, a number of uh, leaders, uh, governors, members of the royal families uh, have been stricken by the virus. Uh, the Saudis have decided to cancel the annual Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca uh, in order to avoid the two million and so people who come into the country each year for this religious pilgrimage. It shows you how seriously uh, it's affecting them. Uh, the question I think is, do they have the governmental competence uh, to really move forward? and protect themselves and get ahead of the virus. I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention uh, the major leadership change that is occurring within Saudi Arabia. Uh, the crown prince is a 34-year-old young man named Mohammed bin Salman, the son of the king. Uh, he, in addition to launching the war in Yemen, uh, is also responsible for the murder of a Saudi journalist named Jamal Khashoggi, who uh, was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul at the time when he was seeking uh, papers so that he could get married. I knew Jamal uh, when I was in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Jamal, uh, at the end of his life, had actually become a U.S. resident living in Virginia and working for the Washington Post. Uh, this is one of the most outrageous extrajudicial killings that uh, we have seen, uh, and this crown prince even though he's trying to modernize the country, uh, has really taken some major risks and is now uh, largely uh, a pariah uh, within uh, the international community. Let me turn now just briefly to uh, my final topic, which is Dallas as an international city. Um, we have uh, been blessed, I think, in Dallas with a diverse economy, with great educational institutions, technology, healthcare, uh, and one of the world's premier airports. In fact, this month, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport is uh, going to become the world's busiest airport. And why would that be? Well, largely because American Airlines uh, is using it as a hub, and they are consolidating many of their flights to originate in Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, the long-haul flights that business travelers have used are being phased back a good bit, and so we're now seeing shorter-haul flights, all of which connect through DFW. So at least for a while, we're going to see DFW as the world's busiest airport. Uh, this year, uh, Mayor Eric Johnson in Dallas uh, asked five uh, Dallas residents who are former U.S. ambassadors to form what he has called the Mayor's International Advisory Council. Uh, the other ambassadors are uh, Gene Phillips, who served as ambassador in Brussels, Jim Oberwetter, who succeeded me as ambassador to Saudi Arabia, Catherine Hall, who was ambassador to Austria, uh, and Richard Fisher, who was the uh, deputy U.S. trade representative. Uh, the five of us are advising the mayor on what we can do to make Dallas a more international city. 
We're focusing on the relationships between uh, Dallas and the Washington DC based diplomatic corps. We'd like to get more foreign consulates based in Dallas. Most of them right now in Texas are at Houston. And if we can't get those, we would like, at least like to have some trade offices. We certainly want to increase foreign direct investment in the Dallas area. Uh, and we very much want to uh, encourage uh, an international mindset, encourage visitors here. And frankly, I think this is where uh, many of you, uh, your clients, your colleagues, uh, can play a role. Uh, the main uh, diplomat on behalf of Dallas right now, of course, is the mayor. Uh, when I was living in Dubai, uh, we actually hosted Mayor Rawlings and then Mayor Betsy Price of uh, Fort Worth, uh, who were members of the DFW Airport Board. The Airport Board takes trips abroad a couple of times a year, and we were delighted to host them in Dubai. Uh, they made great progress in getting uh, more flights uh, from Emirates Airlines and Etihad uh, into and out of uh, the DFW airport. Uh, we have more work to do. Uh, I think we've got to make sure that Dallas is a welcoming city for international visitors, uh, for those who are moving here. And certainly uh, my wife, Kathy, and her title business uh, and uh, the real estate uh, uh, brokers that we know are finding uh, a number of international clients who are either moving here permanently uh, or are having second homes here. We're seeing a good uh, influx from Mexico, uh, from uh, India. Uh, there were something like 150,000 uh, Indians uh, in the DFW area. And so they travel back and forth to the Middle East quite a bit and to South Asia. Uh, and this has fueled, I think, a lot of the Emirates uh, air traffic uh, and other airlines to this point. Uh, but we, we have to continue to find ways uh, to encourage this international focus. We have some wonderful organizations internationally here uh, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We have the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. We have the Dallas Committee on Foreign Relations. Uh, we have the Tower Center at SMU where I work. Uh, and we have uh, uh, many other institutions that are uh, highly attractive to international employees uh, and international uh, uh, clients and customers. Uh, UT Southwestern, for example, has a number of, uh, of doctors and other staff people uh, from overseas who have come here. Our immigration policy needs to continue to be open to that. Uh, they are uh, great sources of human capital great members of our educational institutions, their kids uh, do well in school here. And this is something that I think we can stand to, to emphasize. So as the rest of you go forward, uh, I think it would be really great uh, to be thinking about how to sell Dallas as an international city. Uh, feel free to drop me a line if you want to with any suggestions uh, that you have. Uh, part of the problem that exists as an international city is infrastructure. Uh, Dallas really doesn't have what's called an international office. We have an international visitors program uh, that the World Affairs Council runs with uh, the city of Dallas, but this is largely through the city manager's office. And as the chief diplomat of the city, the mayor really doesn't have a budget. The mayor doesn't have the ability to control uh, much of what uh, is done uh, in emphasizing Dallas as an international city. So this is something I think we all as citizens can work on uh, and it will be very important to the growth of the city. I'm gonna stop at this point and uh, see uh, what questions you might have and I'd be delighted to have a further conversation. So uh, Roxy, this is Hannah. Um, do we have any questions that have come in or are they starting to come in? Um, I'm sure there will be some questions for Bob. We have not had any questions uh, typed in, but this is such a fascinating talk. I didn't want to miss a second of it. I'm sure others are feeling the same way. So, uh, oh wait, here we go. We do have one. Let me see here. It says, uh, what is your advice to a new realtor who's doing business overseas? I'm assuming this is a realtor based here who has clients overseas. Uh, and I would say 
uh, first of all, understand the culture uh, of the client and where they come from. Um, some of some of what we learn is through mistakes and experience, but there will be some parts of the world where the client really is very factually oriented, doesn't much want small talk, wants to come in, uh, see some some uh, opportunities uh, and make a decision. Others are more interested in getting a great deal. And I can recall spending many hours in uh, what we call the rug soups uh, in the Middle East, uh, from Dubai to Riyadh to Istanbul. And there, the negotiation is part of the fun <laughs> and part of the ritual. And you drink a lot of tea and you haggle back and forth over price. And you sometimes get to the point of walking away. And I've walked out the door uh, from rug merchants and then somehow ended up coming back and buying the rug after a while. These are cultural issues that are so different for each uh, culture that you deal with that I think it's important to try to understand that culture uh, as you're going forward. It's also important for them to understand the regulatory environment uh, that you live in. And so uh, when whether it comes down to the Realtors Commission, whether it comes down to who gets the carpets and drapes in the house, all of these things need to be pretty carefully explained because sometimes uh, a, a, a person from overseas doesn't quite have the same cultural uh, notions that we do. Just as an aside, I can tell you that when we, when Kathy and I were looking for a place to live in Dubai, uh, we looked at a number of villas and none of them had built in closets. And so you, you would go from house to house and you would have to envision buying or building in an armoire or some other kind of closet device. And they also didn't come with any appliances. And so there would be this big cavern where you would put a, a range or a stove in and another cavern for a refrigerator but none of that came. And also, by the way, when they show houses over there, the electricity has been disconnected because the tenants have moved out. They will never show you a house or an apartment that is occupied. And so you're going in with no electricity in the dark, 120 degrees, no air conditioning, and trying to imagine looking at a place like that. So the cultural approaches are so completely different uh, in so many other parts of the world. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. Um, let's see, the next one is, they're coming in so quickly, it's coming off the screen. It says, thank you, sir. I appreciate the background information and history you provided. Are women allowed to meet with and represent them in real estate transactions? Uh, yeah, well, it depends on where you're talking about. In Saudi Arabia, it's just, it's just now opening up and women uh, certainly can uh, participate uh, in uh, real estate transactions there. In Dubai, it's very much like the United States. In fact, I think almost every real estate broker we went with in Dubai uh, was, a, was a female. Interestingly, by the way, they do not have an MLS kind of uh, system over there. And so to look at a property, you have to go with the listing agent only. And you can't simply look online and find it uh, without going to the listing agent, which means that you spend hour after hour with multiple different agents looking at multiple different properties. It's extremely inefficient. Uh, and But I, I will also say that for a female uh, realtor here, showing a, uh, a person from another culture a property, you're going to need to take into account how they view women, uh, where they're coming from. And uh, some of them will be dismissive. Some of them will be open to it. Um, I have not heard of any major incidents, but there will, that will be in the back of their mind, at least uh, going forward. Uh, I haven't. There's also, I think, a tendency to find someone from the same ethnic background as the realtor uh, locally here. And so you'll see a lot of uh, of Indians or Pakistanis wanting to have Indian or Pakistani realtors, uh, likewise with the Chinese. Uh, and so I think you're going to see, and it's really a sort of a natural affinity. It doesn't mean you can't overcome it, 
but we have seen several examples of that. Okay, our next question, it says, thank you for your deep insight. How would Dallas go about having an international office and does Houston have one? Houston has an international consular coordinator. Uh, and uh, that's largely because they have quite a number of foreign consulates uh, in Houston. Uh, what we would have to do would be to have a budget. The, the city council would have to pass a budget that allowed for uh, some sort of international coordinator uh, or office. Um, another way to do it, and this is something we're looking at, is uh, through private funding. And uh, I think it, it could well turn out that, particularly in times of a lean budget like now, uh, we would seek private uh, funding to establish some kind of international coordinator's office uh, that could advance these goals and lead to more foreign direct investment, better relations with the consular corps, and the other uh, key uh, objectives that we have. Our next question is, do you know of a way we can tap into the international real estate market in DFW as in getting clients that are trying to move here to DFW? Um, the International Visitors Program uh meets with a lot of people the chamber of commerce also has an international uh office if you will uh, and this is the regional chamber so it's not simply dallas city um, which will receive queries and calls from time to time about people seeking uh to move to the area um, I think maybe another way to do it is also to tap into some of the international businesses that are here who might be moving uh, employees like Toyota uh, and others uh, that have come here uh, from other locations. But I don't think there is uh, a particularly efficient uh, environment right now for tapping into that other than uh, the, the old fashioned uh, spade work of, of uh, trying to, to find where the clients are, where they're coming from. Who, word of mouth, of course, is extremely helpful. Uh, going to uh, some of these international organization meetings, I think, is extremely helpful. The World Affairs Council has, I don't know, 50 programs a year, uh, some of which are free, uh, where you can go, particularly once we're finished with this uh, virtual meeting uh, business. Uh, where you can go and interact with uh, a diverse uh, international community, uh, get to know them, and then they're going to have a brother-in-law or a, a co-worker who's moving in. They will know you and they will know what you do. But it's, uh, it's, it's I think it's just marketing 101 uh, with a view to international clientele. Okay, the next one. Um, how has President Trump's efforts to reduce the scope of the State Department and diplomatic corps early in his presidency impacted our foreign relations? Well, I think, frankly, it's been a disaster. Uh, the State Department has been hollowed out. We have countless uh, presidential appointments that have not been acted on or even nominated. Uh, and we're seeing massive retirements from the mid-level and senior levels of the State Department. Um, you can't conduct foreign relations simply at the White House presidential level. You have got to have the, uh, the professionals on the ground doing the day-to-day -day, uh, hard, uh, sometimes thankless work of interacting with host countries, of helping develop policy, of, of then feeding back to the White House and the National Security Council what they're learning from being on the ground. Uh, so I think it, it, it's really a, a sad situation that, that can be reversed. I know Secretary Pompeo has said he wants to return the swagger to the State Department. Uh, hopefully, uh, he uh, can make some progress in that regard, and whoever uh, succeeds him can do so as well. But I am uh, very disappointed in uh, the, the hollowing out of the State Department as it stands right now. Uh 
The next one we have here is more of a comment. They they weren't real sure how this all related to real estate and now they, they see and they want more topics like this. So thanks for that great comment. Great. Uh, what is the best way to build a relationship with the U.S. ambassadors or in-country consulates for real estate professionals and their economic development groups? I think that's a terrific question. Um, there are a number of honorary consuls in the Dallas area. Uh, for example, uh, Jim Falk of the World Affairs Council is the honorary consul general of Tunisia. I think Hunter Hunt at Hunt Oil Company is the honorary consul general of, uh, of Great Britain. And these people uh, are great people to just go have a cup of coffee with or talk about your interest in getting to know people who come to meet with them. And this is another source of, of uh, perhaps uh, connections of people moving to uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, if there is not a, 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 an official consulate in Dallas, uh, many of them are at Houston and uh, you can uh, go down to Houston, you can call them on the phone, they will have a, a business uh, counselor, if you will, uh, in their office there who is specifically tasked with helping uh, their citizens uh, do business uh, in the United States and particularly in Texas. Uh, these council generals sometimes will also come to Dallas for various meetings. I hosted uh, a couple of times the Israeli council general who came and spoke to my students at SMU. Uh, we've also had uh, various visiting ambassadors come and speak to these various uh, international uh, organizations as well. Next question, what country was the hardest to work with? Well, during my time as ambassador, it was certainly the Saudis. Uh, they were uh, very difficult in the aftermath of 9-11, as I, as I told you, things got better particularly after uh, the attacks in May of 2003 and uh, their final resolve to start going after Al Qaeda. Uh, I would I'd also say uh, during my time in Dubai, while I was practicing law there rather than uh, acting as a diplomat, uh, you would certainly find uh, the Chinese to be difficult uh, to uh, interact with. Um, they're very transactional. It's hard to have any kind of cordial relations uh, socially uh, with uh, uh, with their diplomats. Uh, we found that also in Saudi Arabia. And I think they view themselves as rivals or competitors of Americans to some degree as well. Uh, by and large, though, I was encouraged by the by the, the vast array of, uh, of other diplomats uh, in countries that I worked with. And I got a really good piece of advice from one of them shortly after I arrived in Riyadh. I called on uh, the ambassador uh, of uh, Qatar, small city state on the Gulf. And I said, what advice do you have for me? And he says, a good ambassador has four ears and half of a tongue. And by that, of course, he meant uh, keep your mouth shut for a while and listen very carefully. I thought that was excellent advice. and. Uh, something that I took to heart for quite some time. And we have one final question. It says, have you hosted trade missions and do you find them valuable for, te for Texas? I have hosted trade mission. Well, I hosted one trade mission at my home in Dubai, and that was the trade mission of the DFW Airport Board. Uh, I thought that was very successful because they uh, were interacting with, we had the chairman of Emirates Airlines uh, over for uh, a cocktail hour. We had uh, members of their senior management, their president and so forth. Um, this was an, a, a very high level. I think trade delegations from the Dallas area going overseas are probably overrated uh, to a great degree. Uh, I'm not sure that you really accomplish that much uh, and I know that there is some skepticism about how valuable they are. So I think it partly depends on the level. Uh, it depends on who the players are, uh, and there are good ones and bad ones. Actually, you got a couple more questions in while you were speaking. So uh, one person has a comment that they completed their MBA degree in Beijing, China, and they have their CIPS designation. 
and they wonder if some countries may have issues doing business with women. Well, I think the short answer is unfortunately yes. There are countries that have, I think, culturally a uh, a prejudicial view of women uh, more so than others. Uh, but this is changing really even around the world. Uh, even in Saudi Arabia, uh, women can now uh, vote in municipal elections. They can run for office. They can drive cars. Uh, and so the the terrible prejudice against them that I experienced uh, 20 years ago uh, has has eased up a bit. I don't want to oversell that because there are also women in jail now uh, for having sought the right to drive and for having sought the right to vote. And I think uh, uh, there's still a great deal of, of, of prejudice out there. But uh, uh, even in China, I'm, you'll see many Chinese women are active in the in the party there, active in government, uh, active in diplomacy, and so. Uh, I think you're, you will see some progress being made, but I think we still have cultural norms uh, in, in much of the rest of the world that are not consistent with our values. Okay, and we have time for one final question. Uh, it says, did you have any interaction with the Dubai Real Estate Institute? Not the Institute. I, I dealt with real estate brokers. Uh, I dealt, I, I had some members of the real estate community on what we call the uh, uh, American Chamber of Commerce there. And so we had uh, uh, interactions in that regard, but not with the Institute. Well, thank you for answering those questions. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it back over to Hannah for some final comments. Uh, thank you so much. We, we really appreciate your knowledge and, and your expertise. Um, and I've, I've taken a lot of notes and I've gotten a lot of ideas from what you have told us. Um, and I think one of the things that you mentioned that, that you're remembering, and I think it certainly also can apply to realtors and, and those of us who do a lot of work with foreign, um, I, I do a lot of work with foreigners in Dallas, and you mentioned UT Southwestern. A lot of my clients are the foreign doctors at UT Southwestern. But the one thing that, that I think was, was very good advice that you got and um, you heeded is for realtors as well, having four ears and half a tongue. Listen, listen to your clients and, and maybe speak less or don't speak until you have listened enough to understand who your clients are, um, as well as get to know the culture. Yeah. And that's that's really the most important thing, I think, and, and then move on from there. So thank you so much. We really appreciate you. All the best to you and Kathy. Thanks. Loved it. Thanks for having me.